It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. My guest today is Chip Ingram, CEO and teaching pastor of Living on the Edge, an international teaching and discipleship ministry. For over 35 years, Chip has pastored churches ranging from 60 to 6,000 and served as president of Walk Through the Bible. Chip's direct practical teaching style helps everyday believers apply God's truth to relevant issues, relationships, and challenges. Reaching more than a million people a week, his teaching can be heard online and through hundreds of radio and television outlets worldwide. Chip is the author of 15 books, including The Real God, Culture Shock, and The Real Heaven. Like his preaching, Chip's books provide relevant help for real-life issues, meeting readers where they are, and inspiring them to take the next step toward where God is calling them to be. Chip holds an MS degree from West Virginia University and a Master of Theology degree from Dallas Theological Seminary. Chip Ingram, welcome into the corner office. Great to be with you, Brant. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, it's so great to have you here. And I know you've been traveling a lot and just had some recent uh, health issues that you're dealing with. And I'm just so happy to be able to see you. And thank you for, uh, you know, praying for us before we started for our session today. And we kind of like just to start things at the beginning and uh, would love to hear a little bit about your early life. Tell me a little bit about where you grew up and, you know, what it was like in that part of the country. Grew up in the outskirts of uh, Columbus, Ohio, at at the time a tiny little town called Gehanna, Ohio. It's not tiny Mm -hmm. at all now. Uh, Both parents, school teachers, dad, a great athlete, and Mm -hmm. um, so that influenced uh, everything. And then he was uh, Guam, Iwo Jima, a Marine who has got his mom to sign for him in World War II, so he went in at 16 and a half. Oh, my gosh. That... um, at Purple Heart, he got out because he was wounded, and uh, that actually framed an awful lot of my upbringing. Mm. Uh, I learned by once mentioning that my dad was an ex-Marine and was quickly corrected that there are no such thing <laughs> as an ex-Marine. As an ex-Marine. <laughs> and, um, uh. and so, you know, he uh, his father died when he was 13, and mm. I know you want me to talk about me, but I, I think the... The family situation uh, really was at the heart of what mm. shaped me. Mm. Uh, Mom, the most emotionally intelligent person uh, to this day I've ever known. Both my parents are now with the Lord. Mm. But um, they were school teachers, and so we started out. I still remember all three kids sleeping in one room of a rent house, and wow. Mom and Dad's combined salary was $4,600 a year. Wow. And um, and dad was a very, very hard worker, but out of the trauma, I mean, mm. uh, just he was a 50 caliber machine gunner. So there were times he would describe only twice did he really open up and he just said toward the end, it was better to die than to go home in shame. And he goes, it was like mowing grass. I would just wow. it would come line upon line and I just killed thousands and thousands of people. Mm. Overwhelmed with guilt of killing uh, and overwhelmed with the guilt of why he lived and his buddies didn't. And so, you know, alcohol became the drug of choice, Mm. no PTSD. And so he was a guy with a lot of hurt, a lot of pent up anger, um, a a Christian with regard to general morals and that you go to church. 
but none of us knew anything about a personal relationship save mm. my mother and her childhood. And uh, all that turned around uh, by the time he got to his mid-50s. But so you grow up in that household, yeah. and a dad who doesn't know how to say I love you says, mm. Here, here's what love is. I'll help you be successful. Mm. So by the time I was uh, two or three years old, he was teaching me to read. I was diving off a high dive board in the summer uh, at <laughs> two and a half or three uh, because he got a kick out of that. I could um, I could spell intercontinental ballistic missile for his friends when I was three. Uh, you know, watch this, watch my boy. And, oh my um, goodness. Yeah, I mean, he was Body like, I'm going to help you be successful. And I can still remember at like five or six years old him talking about, you know, something. This country needs a great president of the United States. And. Mm. Um, you could be that person. Oh, I mean, as, as crazy as that kind of talk sounds. And so he gave me lots of responsibility yeah, lots of and allowed me to take really significant risks that built um, a lot of confidence, honestly, and a very entrepreneuring spirit. Um, it. it also built a performance oriented, um, when I do well, I'm loved. And when I'm super successful and achieve not just normal, but way above the normal that's that's when you get the payoff. That's when you're loved. Yeah. So um, I would say uh, uh, generally, uh, you know, good culturally, you know, moral home. You know, we yeah. ate breakfast together, believe mm. it or not, and dinner. And um, and and you know, I think by the time I was eight, I I asked my dad if I could help cut the yard, and I did the front yard, and I think he gave me 50 cents, and I thought, <laughs> oh my lands, this is. <laughs> So I, uh, I literally couldn't hold, I was too small, I couldn't hold the top, so I would lean on the little middle rail, and I started cutting neighbor's yards, and so by the time I was 12, I had eight or nine yards, two paper outs, and I think by by the end of my 12th year, I loaned my parents uh, $6,000, uh, or $3,000 at 6% interest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they and they paid me back on installment. Oh my oh, goodness! What did they What did they need the money for? You know, there was this uh, place of land behind all of our homes that was uh -huh. landlocked, right. and if you bought it, then you would kind of keep the value of your property, and it was a sure. nice area. And they didn't have the money, and, yeah. um, and I was a it. saver. And wow! So from the early days, then it was how do things grow, and how do you make money? I mean, I was the kid who would run door to door at a, I mean, at a sprint and not with a bag, but with a pillowcase because it was stronger during Halloween. And then I would put it in my closet for three to four weeks and then I would take it to school and, sell. and, I, and I would sell nickel candy bars for a dime and dime candy bars for a quarter. And, and it just seemed like, isn't this what we were to made do. to do? Yeah. Why, why are all these people eating their candy up? So that kind of became, you know, wow. then the typical... Basically, deeply insecure, but, you know, the shortstop on the baseball team and the point guard on the basketball team and a uh, just a workaholic in terms of... Good student of, in school as well, Chip? Did you, yep. did you take school oh, seriously? I mean, parents or teachers, yeah. you know, four A's and a B. The question was, what happened? Why the B? Yeah. yeah. Right. Or you go three for four. Uh, hey, how many times have we talked about this? On a curveball, if you step in the bucket, that's why you grounded out the shortstop. So... It was never intended, uh, looking back and with maturity, my dad really loved me and yeah. wanted, thought success would be the way that um, it You're would make me that. happy. And yeah. or yeah. I would. So that was sort of the, the, the background and got two uh, two older sisters. and. Oh, you were the youngest. youngest. I was okay. the youngest. And yeah. the only boy. Yes. Wow. Okay. And, and honestly, my sisters would really affirm this. My parents actually said this out loud. Well, we were hoping for five boys. We had two girls, and um, <laughs> then you came along, so we thought, well, I guess we'll just have to quit. So Stop while we're ahead. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But the the favoritism that I experienced at times, mm. I actually felt guilty growing up. Mm. Yeah. And um, yeah. so... By God's grace, I have great relationship with my sisters now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if they resented me, they, they certainly had uh, every right to. So that, you know, just created someone who was, by the time I was in seventh grade, it was literally, I had it planned out. Senior year, I will, you know, be all league or whatever in baseball right. and basketball, right. get a basketball scholarship, date a very pretty girl, and um, I'll be... Uh, 
you know, a leader in my school and mm -hmm. uh, get a scholarship to play ball in college. And then from there, uh, I'll be uh, a trial attorney. And I had good <laughs> verbal skills. You had it I all mean, mapped is, out by about the oh, age of 12, yeah. it sounds like, Chip. <laughs> and so uh, so that was kind of the, the early years and, um, you know, a work ethic that was really intense. Yeah. And yeah. because I was small, uh, very skinny and short, I was five, three and a half as a freshman mm. in high school. And wow. basketball coach said, you, you really should think about wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was like I, on. <laughs> that was like pouring gasoline on my passion, you know. Oh, boy, and I so I, I played ball and practiced eight nine hours a day, and that's mm. not exaggerating. And so mm. I I grew about eight inches between those two years, and uh, ended up things worked out uh, okay on those areas. But yeah. what I what I look back on was this driven type A yeah, um, personality that a lot of people that end up leading things. But a lot of wounds are embedded in mm. all of that. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's kind of the early years. Uh, did go to church, and it was a, I just call it a social church. We didn't really believe that the Bible was God's word, but, it, mm. you know, you know, be a nice person. Yeah. And um, the transformation beginning in my life was uh, a coach invited me to go to a fellowship for Christian athletes camp. Uh, now, right was this before, in high school or, or uh, in college? Right after high school. Right after high school, okay. And uh, so I, uh, you know, the best basketball players from Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky were going to be there. I thought, great. And Tom Landry was the speaker. And, you know, there hey, you Dallas yeah. Cowboys. Can't beat and that. <laughs> that's the first time uh, anyone ever, uh, I got to this camp, and I didn't know what to expect. And they gave you sort of an easy-to-read New Testament. I think it was good news for mm. modern man. Oh, yeah. yeah a t-shirt that said FCA that had a cross on it. And within about 10 minutes, I thought, oh my. I felt like I got dropped into the land of Jesus freaks. The only time I used Jesus' name was not in a complimentary fashion. Right. And right. it was usually when I missed a shot or something. Yes, yes. And, uh, and so I was suspect. I wouldn't open the Bible the first mm. two or three days. But I watched men love other men. Mm. And I heard a man... Uh, read a paragraph and explain it in a pretty down-to-earth way. And I was compelled to, if there is a God, mm. I wonder what he's like. Yeah. And if there is a God, what does he want from me? And I'll never forget sort of breaking down, looking at 600 athletes on this lawn, all with Bibles open in the morning for 15 minutes. And <laughs> in my rebellion, I wasn't going to do it. Right. But like day three or so, I remember I just opened it. And it just happened to open to Romans 12, and it said, I <laughs> urge you, um, by God's love and mercy, that you offer your body to him as a living sacrifice, mm. one that's holy and acceptable, because that's really what God wants. That's right. And stop being conformed to all the external patterns of this world, but um, allow God to change you from the inside out so that your life could really demonstrate what his will looks like. It's good. Pleasing, it's perfect. Yeah. And I always wondered if there was a God, what did He want? And it never dawned on me what He really wanted was me. Yeah. And uh, prayed to receive Christ at the end of that camp. Wow. Took a Bible home, stuck it under my pillow, so my, my my parents wouldn't have objected, but no one read the Bible, they would have thought I flipped out or something. <laughs> so I put it under my pillow, and I I just couldn't stop reading it in morning uh. and night, and that began um, a, a very up and down but but great journey. The journey. So you went on to college and got your undergraduate and a couple of master's degree. Tell, tell us what kind of decisions and you know, kind of influenced the decision in terms of where you went to go and get your uh, your upper your your undergraduate degree. Well, the uh, the first decision was uh, at my size, um, there one there was not a lot of Division One schools offering me a scholarship, <laughs> and so uh, being passionate about basketball, I went to the school that did. <laughs> Right. And uh, very competitive, and it was an NAIA school in West Virginia. And um, by God's grace, I met a bricklayer there who had a little campus ministry full-time, laid bricks during the day, hmm. and uh, was a disciple maker trained by the, by the navigators. And um, that was the formative years, and uh, just yeah. amazing experience uh, playing ball, watching a ministry grow from 
three or four people in his living room to about 250 students mm. and uh, seeing God's power and lives change. And um, you know, changed my major um, what, what, about seven times. You know, cause <laughs> every every time you know I was going to be a lawyer because I wanted to get rich. Right. You know, and um, and and so I something tells me God was working on working. Oh on my land! One. So I ended up majoring in. Uh, I ended up taking about 23 hours a semester and barely got out in four years because I changed <laughs> things so many times. But I ended up uh, able to teach in education K through 12. And had a, uh, a major in history and then also in liberal arts, had a major in psychology. Hmm. So uh, I thought, you know, I wanted to be like that bricklayer. And coaches, when, when my dad was absent, coaches filled that gap. Yeah. And I right. think I ended up thinking if I could do that for other young men. So uh, I taught school and uh, yeah. coached. And then right after that senior year, I was invited. Did you to move back to Ohio then, or did you? No, stay, I didn't. Uh, that West bricklayer Virginia. had a vision to no. have a disciple-making ministry on all 16 colleges, actually universities now in West Virginia. Wow. And he said, if you want to learn how to do this, why don't you come and help me launch this next one? And um, I felt like that's what God wanted me to do. Yeah. And so uh, I went to do that. But as I as I went to do that, I soon realized. Boy, oh boy, I have I have a lot to learn, and um, I had an opportunity to uh, teach, coach, and then that summer after college was invited to play with a uh, Christian basketball team, and we hmm. toured uh, every country in South America and played oh, all their fantastic. Olympic teams, shared Christ at halftime, did clinics hmm. during the day, and uh, kind of fast forward because I know our time is limited. So that summer and the next summer. Uh, every country in South America realized that the world, and that's what it was like, God could use an ordinary person. I mean, yeah. um, I had, it was amazing to maybe lead 10 or 15 people to Christ every day and share in front of maybe 10, 15,000 people at the halftime, different players, and, and go out to dinner with the other team and share Christ. And, um, and then we, every major city in South America, it was a, quite an experience. And, and were you, when were you I, playing and coaching, coaching or, or coaching? No, I was I was just a player. Just and player. Um, yeah. it was called uh, Sports Ambassadors or Deportistas Embajadores. Mm. And mm. basically, uh, if you, people have heard of Athletes in Action, this was actually yeah. the group that was before them. Yeah, precursor. And, um, yeah. and so uh, – and then there was an Australian team that had a very common vision – and they were really good guys, but they were a little bit weak in terms of basketball. Mm. So uh, I assumed, you know, I was going to be a major college basketball coach. So that it was like <laughs> I wanted Bobby Knight's job. Right. You know, I, I right. just decided that's that's where I want to go. And and uh, so if I'm going to be a major college coach, I need a master's degree so I can teach at the college level. So I was getting my master's in sports psychology okay. and uh, got a call by, by this Australian team and said, you know, we need a point guard. We, we got a big guy. And it was during that time that we toured all through the Orient. So Hong oh Kong, gosh. Philippines, Taiwan. And so within, you know, by the time I was 23, <laughs> I seen had been three quarters of the world, of the world. Yeah. <laughs> and had seen in the Philippines and the outskirts, you know, a $10 bought a prescription Poverty. that saved people's yeah. lives. Yeah. And yeah. meeting with people throughout all these countries in South America that, you just realized humanity is just people are lonely, people are yeah. lost, people are hurting. And I remember big turning point was during that time flying at about 38,000 feet because I can remember the pilot telling us that. And looking down mm. as we flew from the very top of Chile to the southernmost city, Punta Arenas, and as we flew, I just all these lights were below us, and we played mm. in all these different cities and all these memories and all these people. And I remember realizing I need to forget about this trip and go home and get back with my career and my goals, or I have to. I've got to do something about it. But I can't just. I just can't act like this didn't happen. Mm. And I remember at 38,000 feet, telling God, um, I don't know what it would look like. Um, but I just can't see me going back to hot showers and living the way I did and yeah. my life really being mostly about me, though I was a believer. And, and and I think as committed as I knew how to be. And I just told him, 
whatever you want me to do with my life, if you want me somehow, some way to make a difference, I'm signing up right now. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Mm. It scares me, but um, life is short. Yeah. And so I never dreamed that I would be a, a pastor, but um, God had other plans. And so I finished that graduate degree. And by the time I'd been around the world and sharing Christ, and then you come home and people want you to teach at their youth group. Well, now I'm a coach. Why are you asking me? Or this little <laughs> Bible study that we started in this other uh, campus uh, with the bricklayer pretty soon there's 20 then there's 50 then there's 150 mm. and then there's all these college students and you know someone uh, someone said I, you know I think you might have a teaching gift <laughs> and uh, and and you know it was the the second trip to South America a uh, a very very Pentecostal which I really appreciate um, missionary I didn't know what I was doing and still remember a huge outdoor arena in a in a city in Argentina and he, he could tell I just had some desire with the scriptures. And he took one of those plastic milk carton things, flipped it over so you could stand on it, grabbed my elbow, me, put me on top of it, put the microphone in my hand. And the game was over and people were starting to file out. And he said, preach to them. And I said, about what? He goes, you were reading your Bible this morning. What were you reading? And it was a really starry night. And I said, stop. The heavens declare the glory of God. Look at those stars. That God loves you. Come down here and I will tell you how you can meet him. And hundreds of people came down. Oh my and goodness. then I, I said, now, now what do I do? He said, give them the gospel. I said, how? Well, just do it like Billy Graham. I'm not sure if I preached or he did, but he was so fast. <laughs> and every night after that, during that time, he did that. And I think it was one of those just God moments, moments. where, yeah. like, are you kidding me? I'm a school teacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a basketball coach. I'm no preacher. And I think God reminded me, you don't get it. The power is in the message, not the messenger. Right. right. And uh, as a result of that, then after... Realized we were uh, supposed to be, I, I'd hoped to be a missionary and went from uh, that schooling to Dallas Seminary and got what they call a THM, which is a, a four-year degree where you study all the books of the Bible and Greek and Hebrew. And well, it's, we a, added, it's a Master of Theology, right? Master Isn't of Theology, yeah, right. Yeah, right. So that's how, uh, that's kind of how it all started. And, yeah. Um, I would have never dreamed that I'd be a pastor. Yeah. And so, uh, did you start a church then, uh, Chip, or what? What you know, were you brought into one, or how did that develop then, following your uh, your master of theology degree? Did you go right into the ministry? Uh, yeah, I did, but uh, actually, um, all during that time, you, you kind of were in it already. Right? I was always. <laughs> the thing I learned from the bricklayer that was probably the greatest was. He didn't tell me you ought to do this or ought to do that, but I watched him date his wife. I watched him raise his kids, and mm -hmm. I thought someday I would like to be a Christian like Dave Marshall. Yeah. Someday I'd like to have a marriage like Dave Marshall. Yeah. Someday – now, he wasn't perfect, and I got to see, I mean, the good, the bad, and the ugly, <laughs> but someday I'd like to be a dad like Dave Marshall. Yeah. And, and in his perspective, there was no such thing as clergy and lay people. Mm -hmm. I mean – once you became a Christian, and I didn't know any better because I, you know, I, I didn't read the Bible growing up and uh, didn't go to church unless I had to, you know. Right, we went to right. a social deal, but so it was like I, I was in full time ministry because I was a Christian. So you do right. that. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a basketball coach, plumber, bricklayer. We're disciple makers, and that's all I knew. And uh, so I, I didn't feel like, but vocational ministry did right. not ever uh, enter my Appeal mind yeah yeah so uh and it, we uh i i ran a small uh to get through school i uh i, I learned <laughs> i studied for a week and got my insurance license and then i studied all day and got a license so i could um, uh, sell one investment and i did that for a couple years because i worked full-time went to school full-time and had two kids and then later three and felt like my wife should be home with our kids Right. And then um, there was a, a little church of 35 people outside of uh, Dallas, and I'd gone, I'd done that schedule for three years, and it was like get to bed at midnight and be up at 4 or 4.30 to study. And after about three years, I think I was pretty burned out. And yeah. um, so that little church called Country Bible Church in Kaufman, Texas, hired mm. me 
and I uh, I'd never lived out in the country before, and they taught me how to be a pastor. Yeah. And um, uh, they made a five-year commitment because I figured, well, well, they'd been through about seven pastors in the last five years, so they, they were looking for a little security. <laughs> right. But uh, to this day, just super, super people. And um, that little church in a town of about 3,000 grew to about 450. And again, it was how do we help all the people in the community? And I found a gym and we opened it up and we did things that had blacks and whites coming together. Mm. And, you know, we just saw it was a to me, a high impact church is lost. People are constantly coming to Christ, found people really change and mature and the church meets the deepest needs in the community, yeah. usually in partnership with other churches. Yeah. And so we got to do that in that very rural, um, you know, guns in the back of pickup trucks, which I had to learn a lot about how to live out there. And uh, so it was there eight years. And then from there, I think just to stretch uh, my life, we ended up in Santa Cruz, California, that mm. thinks Berkeley is a little too yeah. far right. And... Uh, <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> My son went there. I know. Yes. And, and, but I mean, it's was it's maybe the most progressive place in all the Bay Area. It's true. And, uh, and you know, I, I learned, uh, again, the same lesson. People are people. And whether it's alternative lifestyles or orientations or uh, piercings or they had a lot of uh, new age and demonic worship. Mm. Um, it was it was a season there for 12 years of learning. I had to learn to love people that were different than me, yeah. that were sort of in, um, I mean, people would call it a really redneck little town. Uh, they still, I mean, it was, it was pretty prejudiced in some dramatic ways. And then, you know, I was in the suburbs somewhere in the middle growing up. And then this was a super progressive um, place. And I learned in both, both cases... God doesn't see as man sees. Yeah. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord weighs the heart. But it was a place that was unchurchy. And um, I married my wife because uh, she had two little boys I got to adopt. A little mm. more of my story than you ever want to hear. But um, uh, she she was married and her husband uh, had been seeing someone else on the side. And when she got pregnant... Found out about the babies. Uh, he left with another woman for another town and left her high and dry with no mm. money. Mm. And she came to Christ through that, and I met her about two and a half years later. And so in that era, um, I'd hoped to be a missionary, but there were a lot of mission boards. It didn't matter why you got divorced. You weren't be considered. And um, so we went to a very non-religious place, and we just told people, you know, I came from an alcoholic home. My wife did too. Uh, we're a blended family. God's mm. really changed our lives. We don't have it together. If you want to just journey together and dream a dream where God could do something mm. great. Um, and, you know, it was just one of those, I think, divinely orchestrated. If that church was a glove, he made my hand to go in. <laughs> and, I if, you know, I, and, you know, I mean, I was casual. I When I fell down, you know, I got up and laughed and everyone laughed. It just was no pretense. Yeah. And we just saw it went from oh, maybe eight or nine hundred people to about sixty five hundred people. And, wow. And um, and just I mean, there were times just, you know, 20, 30, 40 people would come to Christ a week and you open the doors and, you know, at a service or, you know, four or five hundred people show up. And two or three, it was crazy. It was like yeah. being on the mission field. And um, so it was that. out of that that a businessman. Yeah. Um, Basically, we were running out of room, and my wife had prayed for a year because I was doing five services. We could talk about burnout, emotionally unhealthy things, stupidity, um, overextended, <laughs> uh, being a workaholic, and then getting over it, and then defaulting. I mean, these these, these are all the dark sides of my life. And um, I was doing five services with video overflow in all of them. And you know, I was going to ask you about living on the edge, but you've now just explained how that concept came about, right? So you got to yes. leave, me, leave me to that. A business guy um, in our church who became uh, a mentor. I think the big thing I learned from my NAV training was be teachable, be available, yeah. and find people that are farther down the road and ask for help. Right. And uh, this guy, to this day, uh, he's been a mentor, but he started living on the edge. I didn't. And um, 
as someone came and said, you know, we think this would really be good on radio. I said, I I'm overwhelmed as it is. And he goes, I mm. got it. Is Can we use the messages? I said, well, sure. I mean, you know, you're my mentor, my friend. And, and so, uh, our, our worship pastor had a background in it. We didn't even tell people where the church was. We didn't ask them for anything. Hmm. We put it on two stations, and one of them happened to be um, just once a week on a station called KFAX, which is f with Salem Communication. And we had yeah. we didn't know anything, but it's their fourth largest market. And a year later, they said, we'd like to try this every day. Wow. And it just seems so expensive. And this guy said, oh, you know what? Until we get it figured out, I'll just pay for it. I said, well, you know, whatever you want to do, then, <laughs> you know. And uh, he said, they said, well, we'll know for sure in six months or a year because uh, we have these morning time slots that are very expensive and people wait 10 years. But we're just going to take a chance. We're going to mm. put you, I mean, this is 30 years ago. We're going to put you between, um, let's see, uh, Chuck Swindoll huh. and um, John MacArthur. <laughs> and so we know people are listening before this time slot, and we know they'll be listening afterwards. afterwards so yeah. it either works or it doesn't work. And I still was not bought in. It was like, you know, you know, okay, whatever, Lord. I, I'm I got more than a full time job. Right. And within six months, we had to literally build an organization. And I remember getting a letter from a lady who said, in the first six months, I'm I was on my way to kill myself. I found mm. out my my uh, husband, who's a second marriage, uh, had an inappropriate uh, incestuous relationship with one of my children. Mm. And I got in, in, in the car and I knew where the train came by and I couldn't oh. deal with life anymore. And I punched the dial louder, 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 louder to get it as loud as I could so I could pull out right when the train to kill myself. And your voice came on and said, never give up, never give up, never <laughs> give up. And I think I was quoting uh, someone and she said, by the time I got done listening, the train went past. And then I got a an email that was a follow-up. Uh, all this sort of came together where uh, miraculous restoration and forgiveness. Mm. And mm. another lady on her way to abort her child turned on the radio. And it was like, Lord, I don't listen personally to the radio very much. <laughs> and my <laughs> wife said, that's not really a good thing you should share. But I said at the time, <laughs> you know. But I, I said, if this is the kind of thing you do, then um, so be it. And yeah. so, uh, you know, a lot of people came together and I got some business guys that were way smarter about all the business side and formed a, you know, a nonprofit and a board. And, you know, you look up five years later and we're on a thousand stations and wow. people want to turn, you know, messages into into books and and, and I would just say for those people, um, you know, I talk about the uh, very first book I ever wrote was called Holy Ambition. I, I think for business people, that tension between ambition and selfish ambition. Yeah. And I think in the, in the church, by and large, there's often not enough ambition that's God focused. Hmm. Um, I, I was so concerned about, oh, I'm just going to be arrogant or proud as opposed to. Why is it that we dream huge dreams with great financial profit for our secular thinking, quote, and then it's like, well, I teach a Sunday school class. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. I, you know, I give, I, I give my 10 percent. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I, what I realized, because I was in the Silicon Valley, this church mushroomed. And then pretty soon, you know, the executive vice president of the time of Cisco shows up and then, you know, uh, people from the most prestigious venture capital firms were coming right. to the church. And, and I started getting to know all these people that had great wealth and great influence and great power. And I realized, wow, they have big, big struggles. And they're yeah. really wonderful people. And there's very few safe places. And living on the edge, and I think the churches and anything I've ever had the uh, opportunity to be a part of, is I, I, I formalized it a little bit later, but I finally came to you know, you all are way smarter than me, and I don't mean that in any false humility. I knew that. And you have much more business experience, and you know how to lead organizations, you know how to manage. I obviously have a teaching gift, and I, and I pastor people. Right. This organization is way over my head. If you will uh, help me, literally help me figure out how to lead and manage and develop, and, and we just felt like the number one thing to do was equip 
the people in our church, that staff members' goal was not to get people to come to church and make the church great, but our goal was to flip it. How do we help you discover your gifts, yeah. your passions, yeah. and do it in the marketplace? Mm. And what I learned was, you know what? Entrepreneurs and, and, and good business leaders, they know how to recruit. Uh, yeah. They know how to cast vision. Uh, <laughs> if, it's not, if it's not in the church's budget, so what? They want to get it done. They figure out how to get it done. Right. And so we, we had this sort of upside down triangle of servant leadership. And we just got those people encouraged and then the relationship was, and here's the deal, because um, I know you've been burnt so many times. I've heard all your stories. Uh, no money, uh, no gifts, mm. no anything. I don't want anything from you. That way I can be super honest with you. You help me on the leadership side of the, the church, and I'll shoot it straight as your friend, your brother. I'll talk to mm. you about your kids, your marriage, mm. and um, very powerful Wealthy people get very little truth because they usually have strong personalities that intimidate people. That's they right. can disinherit you or they can fire you. Yep. And, and so they have a lot of yes people around them to tell yeah. them what they want to hear. And so, <laughs> you know, I, it was a really great season. One, yeah. I learned a ton. And, you know, it was not – to this day, we developed a thing called Prime Movers Inside Living on the Edge to help those kind of people. And, and uh, it, it's just been so exciting to see – you know, hey, you keep living like that, in five years you're not going to be married. Yeah. You know, you, right. you've moved 14 times to get this position. Yeah. <laughs> your, your <laughs> Let me wife, show you the statistics. Your wife is wounded. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. okay, are, are you your really willing? Your kids don't know you. <laughs> yeah. So come on, man. Let's 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 go, let's go into training about rebuilding your marriage and your family. Yeah. And wow. And guys did that, and it was just such a joy. And so that's how living on the edge really got birthed. And Tell us where it's going. T talk to me a little bit about your vision for the future for Living on the Edge. Where's the ministry going? Well, it went from a radio ministry of teaching to, uh, you know, business people with this. You, you see the paradigm shifting. Yeah. And uh, this was probably 10 years ago. And as digital more and more, and I thought, gosh, some of the best teachers, I can go online. I don't, you know, and, and airtime is very expensive on major markets, you know, like you know, $140,000, $160,000 a year for a sure. half-hour time slot in, you know, in L.A., a San Francisco, a top 10 city. And, um, you know, more and more, we, I just saw if people want just really good Bible teaching, there's lots of opportunity. And so we took a huge risk, and we took three of our top 10 cities, and we kindly said, you know, why don't you let someone else have these slots and we took all that money uh, to the tune of about four, four to five hundred thousand dollars, and we invested it in. What if we're here to make disciples, not have people here teaching? Mm. So we created a whole network of uh, small group material. I think we're up to 25 or 27 uh, video stream now, content. small group mm -hmm. material content. Yeah. And I learned that I needed to lead it so that people don't mm. just watch someone and then say. Uh, oh, uh, so what do you think about the 49ers, or the Oakland, or you know whoever your teams are, and the right, ladies right. talk about what's on sale? And so we built into it a DNA of coming before God, doing life in community, and being on mission. And uh, so then we launched, uh, and I think we quit counting, but as of three or four or five years ago, we'd launched about 350,000 small groups wow. in America alone. Thanks. And then what happened out of that was life change. Mm. And um, and then uh, during my time at Walk Through the Bible, we really we had a tremendous opportunity. And internationally, we, we ended up, uh, by the time I left, we were in about 90 countries and um, just had people all around the world. And so I just said, look, I've, I kind of learned early on, except for one or two or three or five maybe authors, um, people get the rights to your books to translate but they really can't do much with them, and there's no money in it. So I built into all mine, hey, look, after six months or maximum a year, I get all the international rights because I want to be able to give them to people who can use this, translate yeah. it, and even yeah. sell it to fund their ministries in countries where it's appropriate. Right. And so uh, it, it created this model where I said, anything I created, you all can use anywhere around the world. And there was tons of videos. And so I kind of went back in my own little world. Uh, after a walkthrough, I realized um, I need to get back to teaching the Bible. Um, 
I got I literally talk about again painful leadership lesson of getting uh, I guess you could call it I was much promoted out of my competency so hmm. I'm not teaching the Bible hardly at all my last year and a half at walkthrough I've got seven direct reports seven different P&Ls I'm traveling all around the world and if I'm awake I'm teaching stuff I've already taught to launch it in a new country or I'm raising money and it it just the life went out of me and yeah. um, so it was good to came back to California and um, did a 10-year run at a church in a another struggling church that's been mine I'm the turnaround guy so every ministry has been <laughs> um, you know one of the a redeveloper if that you know if people love its Harvard business deal you know it's when there's the decline I'm not a visionary as in there's a blank sheet of paper what should we dream I'm I'm the guy that the pieces are, have fallen apart it had a great history yeah. how do they get put back together where you love people through the pain and they see how they fit together in a new way for the future and I didn't know anything about that until I started hanging around with these guys and they said do you realize every ministry that you've ever done has the same DNA <laughs> DNA and same model same <laughs> needs and so you're you're your pastor slash visionary and uh, so that's uh, that's what I'm really excited about. Yeah. And so out of that grew um, a ministry to pastors around the world and, mm. you know, kind of a, a platform globally in lots of different countries and lots of translated books. And then in COVID, this is probably the last rendition. Within two weeks, um, it just looked like things are going to be really rough. How do we help people? Right. And I'd heard people... Um, say for years, hey, Chip, would you disciple me or will you mentor me? Yeah. Right. And I'm not sure what that means uh, exactly, but I thought, you know, I'm glad I did graduate work at a couple institutions and had great <laughs> professors. And but you know something, when I really look back at the change in my life, it was a bricklayer with a high school education yeah. who taught me how to meet with God, how to have my sins forgiven, how to help other people. And so I said to our team, what if, since everyone's home, you know, if we can just get some guy with a mask and maybe just a couple cameras, I'll set it up in my office and maybe a backdrop. I mean, let's not be fancy. And I'll just go, we'll go on the broadcast, podcast, radio, all the rest. And let's just invite people that if you're willing, I'll meet with you personally for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, I'll never talk for more than 10 minutes. And then I'll give you something really simple if you'll give me 10 minutes. And if you'll commit for three weeks, I'll teach you what the bricklayer taught me, mm. how to pray, how to study God's word, when and how to journal, if, if that works for you. And and so um, we had no idea. And I did the very first one, I think it was March or April in when COVID was raging, when it just right. started hitting. Yep. And the response was like crazy. Yeah, and so I've since done about three or four others of those. And what I what I love, you know, really hundreds of thousands of you know views and interactions. But what I've seen is not that was great teaching because I I mean we go through the passage, but it's it's helping them discover what it says and why and how right. and being honest right. with them. Uh, God speaking to me. I'm yeah. starting my day like this. It's transformed yeah. my marriage. I have a completely different attitude. When people feed themselves, convictions get birthed. And we're living in a day where I think cultural Christianity, by and large, will be a thing of the past because the price will be too high. Yeah. And um, yeah. so that's why, for me, I, I live in the Bay Area because uh, we're all made for different places, a different yeah. context. And I die in the Bible Belt, not because it's not a wonderful place. Our headquarters is there, our, in Atlanta. It's really wonderful. Our creative team has an office in, you know, Colorado Springs. Really, really wonderful. For me to birth what God wants me to teach, I have to be in a hostile environment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want to. I want to be where someone looks into you. I mean, are you an idiot? How can you believe that? Or, where are you coming from? And to be right. able to love people, connect with them. And teach in a way where they scratch their head and say, so you guys launched the deal where you're helping the runaway teens and 
you were the people that were helping all the HIV patients. Well, why would you do that? And, and where we live it out in a way where people scratch their head and say, oh, um, I, I've, I've, never, I've never examined the faith personally, but I've just got all these stereotypes just like Christians have of other groups. Yep. And, um, and you've given me reason to pause. Yeah. Right? Huh? Well, Chip, we're just about out of time, but gosh, what a wonderful story. But we always kind of end with one question. And I've been thinking kind of how to phrase this with the backdrop of your story. And I don't know if I should ask you whether you should be advising your younger self, because your younger self, boy, you've told us a lot about him and where you're going. But I'd love for you to maybe speak to, you know, folks that maybe are in their mid 30s or 40s, you know, kind of going through that career and yep. life challenge. Maybe they're Christians. Maybe they were like closet Christians like myself, that they felt they couldn't talk about their faith until they got a podcast and all of a sudden were interviewing people like you. But, you know, what kind of career and life advice would you give to someone who maybe is struggling with that career and faith question and how to go about doing it? What, what would you tell them in terms of how they should, you know, proceed with their career and their faith? Well, I'd say first, uh, it, it all boils down to, to priorities and focus. And mm-hmm. um, every person, if you'll take care of the deep, God will take care of the breadth. Mm-hmm. Um meeting with God every day, being a man or a woman that pursues God, make knowing him, I mean, for real, not so he'll do something for you, uh, but the first uh, hour of every day, and it doesn't need to be that long for you, but a minimum, the first hour for me, I'm in the scriptures, I'm talking with him, I'm learning, I'm growing. Second is, I would find someone that you admire that is a godly person Mm. who's modeling it. Uh, We've got some great people. Uh, One of my friends here, in the Bay Area, who just went from VMware to um, uh, took over as CEO of uh, Intel, hmm. and um, you know, I, I want people to know you can be a bold Christian in a super hostile environment, but you go deep and you do quality, and and there's got to be just just unflinching integrity, uh, money, sex, power, those things, um, they are coming at you. You have an enemy. Hmm. And I would just call it, say, you can't do this by yourself. I, I know you talked about C12 and other groups. It's just yeah. that you have to have a group. You say, we have to help each other. Yeah. And then I would say, finally, at the end of the day, is um, you're going to stand before a living God. And to me, the most lacking thing among Christian leadership, whether they're pastors or business leaders, is courage. Yeah. And you know what? <laughs> it's, what who are we going to please? The fear of man is a snare, but blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I just, I just would say, hey, don't, don't worry about what the polls say. And if God can find a man or a woman who says this man or this woman imperfectly is passionately following me and is willing when I nudge them to take a, a step that's usually risky and you're usually afraid, and does it, um, there'll be short-term pain and challenges Mm. and long-term great gain and it's worth it amen chip ingram ceo and teaching pastor of living on the edge thank you so much for sharing your journey into the corner office thanks brent thank you for listening to into the corner office with brant hanley we hope you enjoyed hearing our guest ceo story as much as we did If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brandt, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.go4roi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.